As most of you already know, we're going to convert our Saturn coupe to diesel power. And this is just a fun experiment. The diesel engine we're going to be using is a Kubota Super Mini 722cc industrial engine. Now, according to the literature, this little engine makes 20 horsepower at 3600 RPM and 33 pound-feet of torque at a lazy 2600 RPM. Not much power from this little engine, but keep in mind it only weighs 140 pounds. Now, back in Season 2, Episode 16, we experimented with cylinder deactivation on the gasoline engine in the Saturn Coupe and discovered the car was drivable with only two cylinders active. While it's hard to say how much power we were making or losing, I reckon this little three-cylinder engine may put out just enough power to make this an interesting experiment. Our initial goal will be to see if it's possible to get the car up to 60 miles per hour. I guess fuel consumption will also be interesting, and we'll do our best to keep track of that as well. Anyway, before we fully commit to this experiment, I think it would be wise to see if this engine actually runs. As I recall, this engine's brand new and it's never been started. So today, let's get this little beast running and make sure we have a good running engine before we put it in our Saturn Coupe. So this tiny engine is only 13 and 3 quarter inches long, and it measures 17 and 3 quarter inches high from the oil pan flange to the highest point of the engine. Now with the correct oil pan, that'll add an extra 5 inches for a total height of 22 inches. So the oil pan on this little gem is monstrous and holds a lot of oil. Actually, I would say it's too big for our needs. Now the reason why this pan is huge is, this engine was originally built to power a compressor on a refrigerated semi-truck trailer. Well, having a lot of oil is probably a good thing, but unfortunately the oil pan will get in the way when we try to mate this engine to the transmission on the Saturn. The good news is, a smaller oil pan is available, and actually, this pan came with the engine when our number one patron, Stuart, donated this engine to the channel. Stuart also threw in a brand new oil pump pickup as a bonus. I reckon the first thing we need to do before we can start this engine is to swap out the oil pan, so let's do that. It's amazing how light this little diesel engine is. That's actually going to help us out a lot, because I really don't like lifting heavy things, except maybe a cheeseburger. Well, using government math, it looks like we have about 6 million screws to remove in order to pull this oil pan. No worries, the Makita impact driver will make short work of that. This oil pan is surprisingly light. I was expecting it to be a lot heavier. Okay, well there's the oil pump pickup that we may have to change, but let's do some measuring first, because it looks like there's a big difference in these parts. So the original oil pan is 120 millimeters deep. Now let's see how deep the replacement pan is. And that's also 120 millimeters. Now I did some researching online, and this pan is the deepest of the two available, so it looks like the oil pump pickup already on the engine is the correct one for this pan, so we can leave that in place. Now I'll just spray some brake part cleaner on a block to evaporate any oil, and we'll do that to the oil pan as well. Now the reason I'm cleaning the parts is, we're going to use some sealant to prevent any oil leaks. I'm not really sure this is necessary, but it can't hurt. So we're going to use Honda Bond to glue everything together. That's right, the reason Hondas don't leak is, they glue the engines together with this stuff. Well, I might be exaggerating, but this stuff really works wonders. Homar Universal Blue is probably about the same stuff, but it's hard to find, and for me, Honda Bond is easier to get on short notice. Anyway, this stuff is made for applications that do not require gaskets, but I've found that it also makes gaskets more or less bulletproof. So now we can place the gasket on the engine, and we'll apply some more Honda Bond to the oil pan. Now, according to some bad information I got from the internet, these silly MA bolts are what to use, but Turns out they're way too big, and M6 bolts are what we really need. Well, here in the US, 25 M6 bolts would cost a small fortune at a hardware store, because we don't use metric here, even though everything is pretty much metric. Anyway, I was able to get these Allen head bolts in the right size through the jungle site with next day delivery, so that worked out pretty good. On oil pans and whatnot, it's easy to over torque all the fasteners and distort the metal, thus causing a leak. So on stuff like this, I'll actually use a torque wrench. This little engine is set up with the smaller 3 8 of an inch wide pulleys, and we'll be using a tiny 20 amp permanent magnet alternator. Yep, this is a true alternator, and yep, it has permanent magnets. We covered this type of alternator in Season 2, Episode 4 and 5. Now these are great for low to medium power applications. A correct alternator bracket is available for about 9 bucks, but we can make something worse for a lot less money, so let's do that. Meh, 
The paint looks like crap, but this'll work. Not too bad. As far as labor goes, well, this is probably more expensive, but sometimes building stuff is faster. So in order to get this engine running, we'll need to attach some braces to the engine block to keep the engine from resting on its brand new oil pan. Off camera, I whipped up just what we needed with some scrap angle iron and some 2x6s. So we're making progress on this engine, but let's take a moment and talk about some of the differences between a gasoline and a diesel engine. Right here is the intake manifold, and if you have a keen eye, you'll notice it's just a hole. Now perhaps if you're more familiar with gasoline engines, you may expect to see a carburetor here. Or if the engine was more modern, you may expect to see a throttle body. I mean, after all, this engine is fuel injected. Nope, not on this engine. The intake manifold on this engine is wide open, with absolutely nothing to throttle the air. The throttle on this engine is actually somewhat convoluted. You see, the speed of the engine is determined by how much fuel is injected through this high pressure fuel injection system. Technically, this engine doesn't even need an intake manifold, and it would run fine without it. About the only thing this manifold does is, it provides a place to mount the air filter. Of course, we'll initially stall an air filter here, but down the road, the manifold will come in handy when we install the turbocharger. So the throttle on this engine is located here. Now, instead of throttling the air, the throttle varies the amount of fuel that's being injected. It's a very complicated system to service, and thankfully this is a new engine. Well, relatively new. You see, this engine's been sitting for nine years. So today, if it all goes well, the engine will start for the first time since it left the factory. Anyway, this screw sets the maximum speed on the engine, and I reckon it's about 3600 RPM. Now this screw sets the idle speed, and on this engine the idle should be about 1000 RPM. Now this lever up here is for the fuel shutoff valve. This lever is spring loaded in the off position, and we'll need to move this lever into this position in order to start the engine. I'm going to leave the spring in place as a safety measure when we do our initial start. If all goes well, we'll remove the spring because I really don't want to hold the fuel lever open all the time. Now down here under this tamper proof cap is the fuel adjustment. We're going to leave this alone for now, but when we add the turbocharger, we'll probably have to adjust this for best performance. Anyway, adjusting this is what makes the engine roll coal, as they say, but once we add boost to the equation, it all works out in the end. Now being that this is an industrial engine, it lacks variable timing for the injector pump. This engine's likely tuned for best performance at a single speed, and therefore the injector pump timing's not really necessary. However, we do have a way to modify the timing slightly, if necessary. And that can be achieved by removing the shim between the engine block and the fuel injector pump. Removing this shim advances the timing slightly, and that's something we may explore down the road. So the last thing is, well, this engine ain't got no spark plugs. Nope, don't need them. Instead, it uses glow plugs, and they're only necessary to get the engine started. Once the engine's running, the glow plugs are turned off. So basically all the glow plugs do is help the diesel fuel ignite for faster starting. Once the engine's running, the fuel ignites by compression alone. It's a pretty cool system. All right, well, let's drop this engine to the ground and prep it for its first start. 30 seconds. Forward, Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. All we need to do now is remove this stuff and replace it with the engine plate, flywheel, and starter. The engine plate is fastened to the block with 600,000 little screws, and some of them are of different length. So it's kind of a puzzle, but we managed. The flywheel bolt pattern is asymmetrical, and that means the flywheel can only fit to the crankshaft one way. And of course, this is going to take a while to figure out. So we'll fast forward through this part because it's frustrating to watch. So now we have the flywheel and starter on the engine. I reckon we need to connect the positive battery terminal to this lug on the starter solenoid and we'll connect the ground wire somewhere on the engine block. All right, so now we're making some progress. Now don't forget to remind me to put oil in the engine. I'm counting on you folks. Fast forward a bit, and now we have a little electric fuel pump temporarily attached to the engine. This little pump will transfer the fuel from the container to the high pressure fuel injection pump. Since this pump is something I had lying around, I think it's probably a good idea to purge the pump in case it might have some gasoline in it. But we'll get to that in a minute. Over here we have a temporary wire connected to the glow plugs on the engine. The glow plugs only need power for a few seconds before the engine started, and a lot of times diesel engines can be started without the glow plugs, especially when the engine's hot. Now this wire goes to the starter solenoid, and we'll use this to engage the starter. 
So now let's purge the lift pump and get some diesel fuel to the injector pump. This seems to work fine, and it's certainly pumping enough fuel. And that should be good enough. Alright, so now we can connect the fuel line to the injector pump. I reckon now would be a good time to add oil to the crankcase. This engine uses 3.9 liters of oil, and that works out to be about a gallon, give or take. Since this is most likely the first time this engine's ever been started, I want to confirm that it has oil pressure. So we're going to connect the DVM to the oil pressure sensor and crank the engine over until the DVM indicates the oil pressure switch has been tripped. Alright, well let's give it a shot and see if we get pressure. There we go, we have oil pressure. And I reckon all we need to do now is bleed the air out of the injector pump. So a lot of you folks probably already know this, but this engine has direct injection as all diesel engines do, and this system operates on extremely high pressure. The Kubota literature indicates that this injector pump puts out about 2000 PSI of pressure, or 137 bar. It can take a long time of cranking this engine over in order to prime the injector pump. A lot of times the fastest way to get the pump primed is to loosen these nuts on the injectors, and this will help lead the air out of the system. Check it out. As soon as we see the fuel spitting out from around the loose nut, that means pretty much all the air has been purged from the injection system. From this point, we can tighten the nuts and start the engine. Okay, so this engine has the fuel shutoff lever spring-loaded in the off position, so the lever I'm holding onto is not the throttle, it's the shutoff valve. I'll take the spring off once I confirm everything's working properly. Alright, so now the shutoff valve spring has been removed, and let's start the engine for real this time. But first, we'll let the glow plugs warm up for a few moments. Now we can start the engine. Wow, this thing runs perfect. Okay, let's try this again outside the building with some water flowing through the cooling system. Stand by. It took a bit of Home Depot engineering, but somehow I managed to find enough plumbing parts to make this science experiment to my garden hose. Now for the output side of the cooling system, I 3D printed a cap for the hose and then drilled a tiny hole to allow water to exit the engine at a slower speed. This will help the water absorb the heat generated by the engine when it's running. Too big of a hole and the engine will run cold, and likewise too small of a hole and the engine will overheat. This attention to detail is probably not necessary, but I want to run the engine for at least 20 minutes to check for oil leaks. Anyway, everything looks okay, so let's start this little engine up. The pulley on the crankshaft looks a little wobbly, but that's kind of an optical illusion. You see the pulley was manufactured with an unusual shape, but it's fine even if it looks weird. We temporarily disconnected the alternator belt in order to keep the water pump from spinning. However, at some point we did check and the water pump and the alternator spin fine. The idle speed recommended by Kubota is 1000 RPM. I'm not sure what the engine's idling at. But, if we try to lower the idle any more, the engine will start to surge. Let's goose the throttle a bit. Now, I can't rev the engine too much higher, because it'll start moving across the concrete pad, and that'll upset the hoses for the cooling system. So at this point, the engine's been running for about 10 minutes, and so far, no oil leaks. The water coming out of the cooling system's hot, but not too hot. I reckon it's about 105 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's hot for a human, but cold for an engine. I think this engine's going to be perfect for our experiment. Let's talk about the engine and what we're going to do. Well, it looks like our Saturn Coupe's going to get the diesel swap, 
Now I reckon all we have to do is put the engine in the Saturn. How hard could that be? Now I've gotten pretty good with this video editor, and it looks like it's going to be pretty easy. Check it out. Yeah, not too shabby. We can even make it run. Well, I wish it was that easy. As I understand it, it's a lot harder than that. There's all kinds of nuts and bolts we'll need to screw the engine in, and I think we may even need a hammer of some sort. We'll figure it out, don't worry. So, all joking aside, we're going to mate this diesel engine to a 5-speed transmission, but not just any transmission. We're going to use the MP3 Saturn Close Ratio transmission that's normally found in the Saturns equipped with the twin cam engine. This gearbox will make it easier for the little diesel engine to accelerate the Saturn up to speed. And we're also going to use a regular clutch on this swap and not the convoluted torque converter clutch we used on our Honda Insight. In the next episode, we'll dive deep into the transmission adapter that we fabricated and show you folks how it was all done. And now if you made it this far into the video, I want to thank you for watching and let me share a secret with you folks. Over the past month or so, I've suffered from temporary hearing loss due to allergies. The doctors reckon I should regain my hearing soon, but it's been quite a challenge editing these videos with over 70% hearing loss. A lot of times I depend on my friends to help me make sure everything sounds okay. If these past few videos sound different, well, now you know. If you did notice a difference in the sound quality, leave a note in the comment section. It'll help us to improve the videos in the near future. If you liked this video, please click on the like button, and if you don't want to miss any of the upcoming episodes of our epic Saturn diesel swap, please consider subscribing. That really helps us out a lot. Until next time.